Hi, I'm Seamless, and this is a video brought to you by Razer, who were kind enough to furnish me with this, the Razer Blade Pro, upon which you are seeing everything that you're being produced to perform in front of you. Almost did that right. Anyway, uh, this is going to be a video that's going to sh illustrate the basics of synthesizing drums from nothing. Absolutely nothing at all. I'm going to use Citrus NFL Studio, and then as well, I'm also going to show you how you can use your synthesized drums as layering against non-synthesized drums, so that you can make better drums all around. It's all way going to be a good time. Boink. Move the microphone. Rotate the microphone. Now we're here. <clears throat> cool. So, let's start with kicks, because they're kind of easy. Um, <clears throat> and you look at any given kick, right? I'm going to turn down my monitors, because I don't want to feed all the back. Right? Cool. So you look at any given kick, and you look at the spectral activity of any given kick, and you can kind of see that um, they all just kind of do this downward motion from an upward to a lower kind of deal. And then there's a tone that they all kind of they rest on, and then there's just other stuff happening depending on how sharp the kick is. A darker kick is going to have not a lot of high frequency activity. It's just you can just see that, and then you can have somewhere. There you go. Much harsher kicks to have much harder high frequency activity. So on and so forth. Point is, is that um, this activity is what we want to emulate when we create this in our own synthesized environment. Let's do that. Open us up a patcher. Set us up up the bomb. Citrus once more. So when I'm doing uh, atonal stuff, stuff that's not designed to be melodic, what I'm going to do is I'm going to disable the ratio settings. The ratio settings are to keep everything in tune when you're using notes, but we don't want, really want to do that. I mean, you could, if you want to tune your kicks, you, you do want to do that, but for this instance, I'm not going to do that. And we're going to use the regular hertz value to just set a tone. And no matter what note I press, oops, that's not a note. Yikes, this up here. I have X put open on the other monitor. So I, I, I literally thought I was looking at, at Valve from down there. Anyway, um, you get the one note there, and then if you go to any other note, it's just the same note. Point being is that now we have a kind of a, a, a baseline, if you will. We want to emulate that downward motion, so we're going to go to envelope on the pitch side of things, and we're going to just have that have a go. The way the envelopes work inside uh, the pitches of Citrus when we're doing this, let's kind of zoom in on this because we're going to need to see some thangs. Um, is that the center value is original pitch, and then there's up and down, plus or minus an octave by default. Up here we have this uh, pitch envelope amount, and you can bring that down to be less than that, uh, and you can also go all the way up, which will make it four octaves up and four octaves down. This is going to be good if you want to have a lot of, like, a large travel on your kick, but you also might not. So if we go back to the original octave amount, and we just have this what we got here going on, doing it by hitting notes, you can see in the activity that it's doing that kind of downward thing. And it kind of also sort of sounds like a kick, but it's just a lot wrong with it. Um, and the, the most of that is to do with the shape of the curve itself. Neat. And then if we increase the range, we can elicit a higher frequency response. And we can even sort of trick it by not using the original pitch anymore instead of starting at a much higher pitch and going above it and below it. Now, you also might have noticed when we're doing this that it kind of breaks up there. And this is to do with the fidelity of our envelope. In Citrus, on the main page here, there's an option for high quality envelopes in the draft setting. There's the draft and a render setting, and the difference is, is that the draft's what you're hearing right now, and the render is what you're going to hear when you render your song. Um, oftentimes, if you've ever thought that something sounds different when you render your track, it might actually be because of the setting. There's a bit of anti-aliasing involved in the render version that's not present in the draft version. If you're doing plenty of crazy things that, that uh, FM and stuff are designed to do, you're probably aliasing kind of a lot. And that in mind means that some tonality of that is going to be a, res a result of aliasing. And if you're not, if, if you're not really noticing that, 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 that that's there, you might notice when it's gone. Um, and the way you can just sort of make sure it's the same is to make sure the settings are the same so that it'll render what you hear. Um, in this case, though, we do want to have on the high quality envelope setting. And what this will do is pay more attention to the to, uh, interpreting this curve here, because this curve, 
as good as this curve is, is not at all what that envelope was doing. Because if it was, it wouldn't have broken up there. Because notice now that we had the high quality version on, it's nice and smooth up top there. And it's basically just uh, pulling it harder. And now when we do that, we have more control over the tone that we're doing. There's actually plugins out there that kind of do this, that are basically just this, that it, just an oscillator and a curve. And you, you kind of, you are moving the curve around to uh, create a change in the overall tone. And you, don't, you add more points and you change the curve types, you can get even more different responses. <laughs> Particularly um, ridiculous one right there. Probably don't need to be that loud. But this is kind of the idea. And, and notice, actually, here's a, this is a pretty good illustration of the activity of the curve versus the spectral response, right? So see this little, see this little like frequency spot happening right there? That's happening because the curve is coming down and then slowing down for a second, hanging around at this frequency and then leaving again. And when I move this point, you can see that it gets higher and lower pitch. This is to illustrate that if you want to get a certain, like, say you want to hang around or, like, emphasize a particular frequency range more, you do this with the speed of the curves at particular points up and down the curve. So, like, uh, a more reasonable example would be, like, if this was just, like, a linear thing, like, just one thing going all the way down, it sounded good and didn't really need to be messed with you much. Like, if you're into this kind of synthy kick thing, which is to do with the speed being slow enough that you can hear the descent still, that, like, juicy kind of synthy tone is what that is. And you can mitigate that by just going really, really fast, but of course you lose a lot of tone. So let's say you want to kind of accentuate a particular part of the spectrum, you can do that by introducing TAT beta curvature. Now, this, of course, you can play around with curves all day and that's all well and good, but the, the kind of the smart method when you're messing with kicks in any regard, when you're mixing it and synthesizing it, layering it, any of it, is to really be considering it in two parts, the top end of it and the low end of it. You could accomplish that by messing around with fine enough curves and getting the frequency response out of there just by, just by doing this, but that's a lot of work. Um, the sort of more responsible choice is to identify kind of where you want this low end to sit and have it kind of be down there. That's a bit low. Also on top of this, you, you wanna uh, introduce a volume envelope, because right now if I just play, if I just hit the note, it'll hold it. And again, we're not tuning it, so I don't really want to do that. So we also want this guy to happen. Right? So now we go back to the pitch of this uh, operator one guy. And if you see here, I can keep it kind of low and it'll still work out. And there's a bit of a trick you can also introduce here. Even though we do want to, we're basically going to leave the high frequency to another oscillator, we can still have this guy play a little bit in a high frequency by changing the phase of the oscillator. Phase, if you're unfamiliar, basically just means when in the oscillator it, it begins. In this, in this particular instance. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, wow, I didn't know that light was right behind me. Yeah. Cool beans. So now, the top end. The top end is usually a kind of a clicky affair, right? And this is actually the easiest part of the whole thing. I think I might have said that about the, um, about the low end bit of it, but... Uh, the only reason why this part gets a little bit more complicated is just because of the options of what you're able to do without destroying everything are a little bit greater. Because um, what I mean by that is ultimately we're going to make an oscillator that has just an incredibly short volume envelope. And once you do that, it's really kind of hard to make it like a problem. Because at that point, it's not, it's not open enough time. And the, 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 the whole point of this is that we're, we want a higher frequency response to happen. And that means we can, happen, ha we can have it come in and go away faster while getting the whole picture of it. In particular, we want it to be high enough and fast enough in the envelope that we don't hear a tone. Like, we kind of hear a tone right now, right? Doing that. And then if I, like, the, the, the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to FM the crap out of it, and I'm going to do that with just weird pitches, and it's going to be out of tune, and maybe not that high pitch, Jesus. Wow, relax. Values. 
cool one in like, I don't know, harmonics and phase and different cool and there you go. All right. There's something like really gross and metallic, metallic like this, right? And then um, it, we, we, we can hear oscillation of the highest kind of frequencies enough that we are still getting a tone, but we don't want to do that. So we want to go even harder until we get that kind of stuff. Now, once we've done that, we can start to ma manipulate the parameters we just screwed with to make this mess. Like, I didn't really pay attention to what I was doing when I was putting stuff down. Like, I just wanted to create a, just a kind of cacophony of destruction, right? Because now, when we mess around with it, we can start to, like, a, a, a target where in the frequencies the response is. You can also use filters. We can just put it in there and use a bandpass filter. And that's probably the smart response. But some of the, the weird, tiny kind of textures are, are to do with certain things, so we can kind of mitigate that. Mostly about choosing the right pitch. Cool. And then when you layer that with the other guy. It actually starts to come together like an actual kick is supposed to. Now this is enough to basically be the foundation for pretty much anything. Like you have not only a perfect separated low end, but you have basically a perfect separated high end with how fast things are. We barely need to filter things because we, we've synthesize them to fit together the way they're supposed to. And the the, per, the the methods of screwing with it are pretty much endless, and we can even introduce a certain amount of like humanization to it by doing things like uh, randomizing certain parameters, like uh, randomizing the phase or volume of the FM happening here um, of individual guys. You can see, you can kind of see the frequencies moving around a bit now, but not really enough. And if you wanted to make that more, we could start to randomize the pitch of things. And that will move things. Same thing with the other guy. But of course, if you move it a little too much, it starts to sound like a little unpredictable. But you can make it predictable by identifying the range yourself. And maybe even alternate the phase of the initial guy out here. So on and so forth. Um, to make this sound more real, if you wanted it to make it sound real, to be perfectly honest, my goal for using synthesized parts for kicks and things is, and snares as well is usually to overlap it with something that I already have. And if I'm going to, if I want it to sound realistic, it's going to be because I have a sampler library that has realistic drum sounds already. And I'm layering this in there because realistic stuff has a real hard time getting the right amount of loudness out of it that we want in crazy, super hard stuff. The synthesized stuff is way better for that thing because of the targeted frequency-based creation nature of it that we are fitting things precisely where they need to go because the assumption is we're going to push everything so hard that that targeting is going to save us a lot of headroom. Um, uh, 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 recorded things tend to behave in a way that makes it a bit difficult to process. That's the whole point of synthesizing this stuff. So let's talk about snares. Uh, any given snare, if we look at the uh, sort of the do that we're doing here, uh, I was just about to do this in this other guy, but I'm actually going to save this preset so that you guys can have that if you want. Uh, I made this in the pageant because I expected that I was going to do more post work, but I didn't really need to. Uh, this time though I might because snares are just a teensy bit more complicated. Let's go back to default. Yep. All right. Let's go look at some snares. Because again, when you're when you're when you're wanting to recreate stuff, which is really what we're doing when when you're synthesizing a thing, you want to uh, the spectral kind of analysis is, is a pretty good way to start. Doop 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 doop. Awesome. So these are all dopey electronic snares, but they have enough of the similar qualities of stuff that you might want to do. And as well, real snares look like this anyway. So the parts that a snare represents in here that I tend to think of them as like their parts. We had the fundamental tone, the note that the snare represents. That kind of you can even hear that kind of ring going on there, right? And this is basically to get that a business going on. It's the same thing we were doing with the kick. We're gonna build that using an envelope and an oscillator, but it's gonna be a lot much smaller because there's more parts that are gonna be fit on top of it. <laughs> Did you understand anything I just said? Because I'm not sure I understood what I just said. We'll find out. Vote now. 
Sometimes you might find harmonic activity with the uh, with the fundamental inside here, like more metallic sounding snares. Let's see if I have something relevant for that. Uh, da -da 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 -da. I don't want to play <laughs> samples that are purchased things because I don't want to piss people off. Uh, let's go into. Oh, you know what? I made some stuff. Where is um? Oh, it'll be in samples because I made I I predicted this and I made a folder that's named the thing I want to do. <laughs> Do we? So these are these are actually synthesized snares that I developed myself. Trying to find a couple that have harmonic. There you go. But that's that's um, it feels a little bit like cheating using one of my own examples. But I accomplished this by um, basically the, the area of harmonics that exists, exists in the middle is its own separate thing, separate from the fundamental. So that's two parts now. And then kind of on top of all of that, you have this sort of papery sounding, well, the paper, the, what I call it the paper, like, I really hate using those words because what the hell does that mean to you guys? But um, up here in the, let's call this the 1K, uh, 5K range, because that's where it is, um, claps tend to live in there. Like that kind of, that's where that frequency range exists. Um, in fact, if you go find some claps, you can see what I mean. Like this exact range of stuff is the clappy kind of thing that exists in snares, and especially in modern snares that like take advantage of that tone that they want to have. Let's actually look at some of the older guys, right? These guys. Like that that kind of activity up in that upper range is, is basically claps. A lot of times, it's claps. They're just called snare claps. Look at that. But um, beyond the top of that, there's a kind of a white noisy papery range. It's basically a white noise, and if you're going to synthesize it, white noise is usually the easiest path to go. Um, it, it's also kind of the easiest path to use white noise if you're going to synthesize everything all like that, like, fully. But oftentimes it's easy just to get a clap, you know, and do that kind of thing. But also, you don't got it. Um, there's fun things you can do, um, to s sort of get the result. Let's do some of them. Yeah, so. Like we were doing, but this time much higher. 200 hertz is kind of like the standard for like dubstepy kind of stuff. Just refer to them as 200 hertz snares. And then you get yourself your pitch envelope. This time we're not going to need to modify much about the pitch range because the range is honestly going to be fit just fine inside what's available because we don't need to move it much. Also going to change phase. We're also going to go into the volume and create a volume envelope. See, that already kind of sounds like, like a snare without its snares, right? Just a, a doofy kind of like a tom almost. And in fact, synthesizing toms is not unlike doing this. As, fudge, as such, as fudge, yes, as such, actually this, this slope needs to be a bit faster. And this needs to go away a little bit faster. Cool, right now the harmonic thing right if you want if you do want to do that stuff the way that that works is it's actually much simpler fm than what we were doing with the clicky stuff with the kick because we actually want to we want to um preserve some of the like sine wavy like nice smoothness of it which means light touch light touch but still high frequency all right not that yeah that's fine you want it to kind of be in the range of where that lives. Remember what we're looking at when we're looking at the uh, analysis. This is how I'm choosing what values uh, to use, is that I, I literally have compared this stuff to what the, the targets that it want look like. And then I've done it enough times now, I just remember. Let's see, what is that, 580? So let's do together. So, when you're, if you want the, the quote-unquote metallic sound, what you want is a not harmonic tone. You want a not harmonic series of harmonics. You want some harmonics, but you don't want them to be the regular kind of octave on octave kind of thing. When they get at a pitch like that is when you start to get the wrong feeling. And if you hear the, the motion together, you get that kind of Star Trek-y, that's what the ship sounds like, right? <clears throat> but uh, the reason why it sounds like that, if you just play it out together, kind of like a bell almost. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to... Do I want it to snap on or kind of fade in? Sometimes the fade sounds better. Like, do one of those. 
that we're going to want to move the pitch of some stuff, but lightly. Because the pitch is what determines the sort of the order of the harmonics. Alright, you need to be higher frequency than that. A lot higher than that. Like... Oops, I've got I've gone into steel drone territory. If you actually while I'm doing this, you might have heard a whole bunch of different kind of things that kind of sound like what's happening. The um and the truth of that is that that's really you can, that you could use this technique to do a lot of that. I don't see for how low tune this is that that kind of is correct. There we go, but it was too intense. So yeah, that worked out. Now you saw, I, kind of unfortunately when I did that there, um, I created some weird low frequency interference and that's kind of a, just a result of what FM does. Uh, I think that might get cleared up if I, nope, nope. Band limiting isn't gonna help either. Uh, so to kind of mitigate that, this is when you start, this is when patcher starts to come into handy because uh, I guess start to want to separate those two parts. So in this case now, this is separate enough that I can do some correction on the layer. So everything is layering eventually, right? Yeah, as well because we don't want the harmonic interfering with the fundamental tone, which is supposed to be the only thing that happening down in a particular area. Neat. So now the next step, uh, the clapping bit. And I'm just gonna straight up do this. And anyone does keep together with the layering uh, idea that we're doing. Do do do. Just get ourselves a eh, another guy auto auto high passed below the fundamental just to keep it safe. And this is gonna be basically an all noise experience. Um, and like you can get more kind of tone out of it. But when I do that, it's going to be through the use of like external processing, like distortion, that kind of thing. Uh, in this case, that might probably be way too loud. Let's do, yeah. So we can kind of, we can rely a bit on the, pro the post-processing to make the snap a bit better. So what I actually want to do first is the clap part, not the high frequency, the highest frequency, the highest frequency bit, yeah. So we're gonna do this with a band pass. Yeah. So watch this. We look at output of just the noise here. And what a bandpass does. So even just putting it there, it already kind of sounds right. It's, it just has the qualities that we're looking for. But we're going to kind of go a little further with it. We're going to modulate uh, things like the release time, or rather, rather the, release, <laughs> the resonance of the filter, which is going to change like the width of this window we've created. If you want to get really hardcore, you can actually kind of emulate what a clap is like by going really far into that envelope and like making the jaggedy kind of additional transients in there and making sure you have the high quality envelopes engaged while it's still doing so. But um, this is basically kind of the results that we kind of want for that kind of town, that kind of town. Clap town. Of course, we can also modulate the frequency of the cutoff. That's where that kind of sound comes from. That's a little more clappy sounding, right? Neat. And then the last step, the highest frequency noise. This isn't going to require any cue because, actually no, it will because uh, phase. We want the phase to be aligned and the EQs do introduce a teensy bit of latency I probably could just disable all that, and for the sake of processing, I am going to do that. 
the high quality so this 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 is oversampling what that does and it's supposed to do, deal with aliasing uh for when you're doing higher frequency cuts on the filters i guess when you're doing much higher frequency phase change i guess it's a problem i'm not totally sure why that happens but it's an extra processing thing when you turn it off it's a it's better uh but when we're doing percussive stuff you want your phases to be really well aligned because when you tell things to play all at once together and they don't and you try to process them like could like compress things together that little flub might be the end of a of a nice punch is why so now high pass okay but default now because i don't need to do a modulation business with this honestly you could just kind of put the noise in there and it'll feel all right because we're gonna layer with a bunch of those but the other junk i'll just use the svf yes but volume two do 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 neat Just kind of making small adjustments. Oops. <laughs> kind of sounds like a seal. Uh, volume envelope output on this guy. Oh, I did that on three. That was weird. No wonder. So after this, um, sometimes I like to kind of I do I'll do small stuff to individual elements, like especially when we're talking about uh, room stuff like reverb and whatever. Having individual application on, on each of these individual parts is great because that means you can have a kind of like a different spread on the harmonics or a different spread on the highest frequency, a different spread on the clap bit, and it makes it uh, feel a lot more uh, organic that way. This moment though, we're just gonna kind of crunch it all together. They need to do this on a kick because the kicks, they, there's not enough parts in the kick to really require uh, this kind of like post control. Whoosh. Whoosh. This, this being Maximus, this is basically the equivalent of applying an OTT on things. Turn this way the hell down. <laughs> right? All right. So when you're compressing snares in general, right, you, want, you, got, you got to keep track of uh, your time variables on how you're doing stuff. Uh, especially like I, I set this up to represent the lowest, the sort of the fundamental tone range, kind of the, the mid clappy kind of range, and then the highest frequency range up there, the tinny, tinny kind of stuff. And that means this is where the fundamental kind of like oomph is coming from. See a little bit better about that, yeah. So now I want to go back to the freaking noise and adjust this a bit. Better. What the hell happened to the fundamental? Oh, that's right, I'm, I'm freaking soloing it. It's a lot of higher frequency, it doesn't really need to be compressed that much. But if you, so I'm kind of, I'm using this a bit to kind of distort it, the high frequencies a bit, and that's to break up the fact that it's made out of noise. Um, I was talking about layering before, and like you could basically replace every part of that, the clap in the high frequency bit, with just other stuff, and it would, do, it would accomplish basically the same idea. The way that we broke up this layer is the way you would break it up. Fundamental, the, the harmonics, if you're doing that, um, the clap stuff and then the noise stuff. That's what happens when I play too many notes at once. All right, so this noise has to come down faster. And the other noise kind of does too. Cool, and then they get turned up. 
also in here. That's a little better. If I let go of the note, it doesn't play um, the whole thing, and it just releases on some of them, and some of them are actually still playing because I didn't put... Uh, you saw me doing this earlier, coming here and going to be like, so stay in loop end. If I don't do that on every single one of those, and one of them is longer than some of those guys, if I let go of the note, it'll travel to the end of that. That's why it's getting weird. That's kind of what I want. All right. Ooh, it made it kind of like a filtery kind of sounding thing. Neat. I'm going to add in a little bit of the saturation and I'm going to use it to distort it a bit. And that's going to retain some of the original punch. Hey. Let's uh, double the oscillation here. There you go, and then yeah. So the adjust the adjustments that I'm making to the var the variables up here um, are a little bit different than how I would do it if I were doing any kind of like uh, a melodic sound, because the melodic sounds have to rely on. Um, the time variables fitting within their oscillations. With a percussive sound, it's an event. It's a thing that happens, and then just, it just kind of reacts to it. Um, to that regard, I want the things like attack and the delay on everything to be a bit special. Um, the, the expansion that I'm doing here with this curve pointing up like this, which is a bit different than a regular kind of compression you might expect from just a typical threshold ratio setting, um, this attack actually means it will give you more attack. That's why it got sharper when I was doing it, when it happened, and also a little bit louder. Um, Versus uh, the mids and the highs, I also did on the highs to get some of that snap going. But in the mids, I did put the attack off. And that's because I actually wanted the compression to be perfect. I wanted it to be a wall when it came on and it fit it to that curve no matter what it did. So that it didn't allow any of the original thing to come through really loud. It doesn't really loudly for some reason. Um, also a bit of a long release and sustain to, to, to support it being that kind of squashy kind of sound. That's I did that. That was why it, that sounds like that. And then... Um, Sad snappiness on the high end, and then on the master, the attack does a different thing. It's actually a bit. It's actually look ahead delay. It's actually what the LMH delay does on low, mid, and high all together, but separately for the master. Um, and it kind of ramps up uh, when the transients hit on things. And you kind of, I, I don't want that to happen. So, and also, but I need it to happen because the trans there's nothing behind the transients to the ramp up anyway. Um, and what this helps uh, do is that when the snap happens, the snap happens. And then at the very end, what I did here with the soft saturation was to create a, a, the ceiling is at zero dB by default. And there's two different kinds of modes. And what this is supposed to do is that instead of it um, cutting off like digital digital distortion will cut off completely, the uh, regular saturation has a bit of a curve to it that things that come up and it, it sounds kind of nice. Um, but in this case, I'm using it to be a, a total cut. And that's because um, the sounds of the snap are a fast thing. It's a thing that happens instantaneously. And compression, not necessarily, is not. Um, it's a smoother aspect that is created to prevent harmonic distortion from happening. In this case, though, um, we want that to happen. We want that to be part of it because that's what the tone asks for. And also, it's, it maintains the snap as hard as possible, which, as a standalone object, um, might be kind of harsh, but mix-wise, that's extremely valuable because then you can cut it up and move it around and still have enough to work with, and as well, it will compete with things because you have the snap in happening instantaneously, which distortion does, which is why it creates the harmonics because it happens faster than the oscillation happens and it changes the shape of the waveform. That's why the wave shaper is called the wave shaper. And versus distort uh, that compression, which has time variables that specifically make it happen slow enough, if you said to be that be so, and in a lot of the cases here we said to be the opposite. But if you do said to be that way, it's supposed to prevent harmonic distortion so you could keep things loud without making it breaking it, right? But in this case, we're using that to our advantage. Anyway, I hope this helped a lot. If you have any questions about any of this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.